Tonight at 10, England and Scotland's much-anticipated Euro 2020 clash ends in a draw at Wembley. Mount's delivery. John Stones is there! Hits the post. Both sides had... Ch a roller coaster ride for fans watching on big screens in both nations as Scotland managed to keep England at bay. We'll have the latest from Wembley and we'll be live at the fan zones. Also on the programme tonight. <laughs> smashing a blue wall in Buckinghamshire, a stunning by-election victory for the Lib Dems as they take a seat that's been Tory for almost 50 years. More summer holiday uncertainty as Italy announces all visitors from Britain must quarantine for five days on arrival from next week. Polls have just closed in Iran's presidential election. We'll report on the challenges facing the country's new leader. And the British woman attacked by a crocodile in Mexico leaves hospital. Her twin sister, who saved her, describes their ordeal. And coming up in sport on the BBC News channel, Cameron Norrie beats Jack Draper in the Battle of the Brits to reach the semi-finals at Queen's. Good evening. England and Scotland's hotly anticipated group game at the European Championship has ended in a draw. Both sides had their chances on the night but were unable to take what would have been a famous win. Fans had gathered throughout the day with thousands of Scots travelling to London, many without tickets, in high spirits. The result leaves both sides still able to qualify for the next round. Well, let's go live to Wembley and the very latest from our sports editor, Dan Rowan. Dan. Sophie, a 149-year-old rivalry was about to be renewed. For just the second time in a major tournament, England and Scotland, those two arch rivals, would meet 25 years after that iconic match here at Wembley at Euro 96. But England, despite being favourites at times, were outplayed. And amid an atmosphere that stirred the blood, despite Wembley being just a quarter full, it's Scotland, I think, who will go home by far the happier. No older rivalry and no greater stage. A quarter of a century had passed since Wembley hosted the only previous meeting between these two teams at a major tournament, one of England's most memorable victories. But the visitors have enjoyed success of their own here. A night of history and hope lay ahead. I think we've got a really good chance here. We've got a good squad. Good line-up. Anything can happen. England always underestimate us. We've been written off. We've, we've totally got nothing to lose here, so let's do it. I'm nervous. Uh, I can see I can see Scotland's getting a goal and it making it a bit nervy, but I think we'll come through. We'll get we'll get what we need. Although a moment of solidarity quickly followed, Scotland joining their rivals in taking the knee. They may have been underdogs, but it was the visitors who threatened first. Che Adams with the early chance. In a lively opening period, John Stone's towering header, then coming agonisingly close to putting England ahead. Hard to believe 40 places separate these teams in the world rankings. With England needing more energy after the restart, Mason Mount tried to provide it. This, their first shot on target. And minutes later, captain Harry Kane was also withdrawn after another below-par performance. But it was Scotland who looked more likely to score. Adams again going close. Straw the final result, but a point Scotland will be proud of. Dan Rowan, BBC News, Wembley. And let's get more now from Dan. What does this mean for both sides then in the tournament? Well, despite a relatively disappointing performance by England, that was a point that takes them a step closer to qualification for the knockout stages, Sophie. Had they won, it would have been guaranteed that they'd have been through to that second round, but because it's a goalless draw, they will have to now uh, hope for another point at least uh, against the Czech Republic on Tuesday night, and while Scotland play Croatia, and they will need a win if they are to get through to the second round for the first time in their history. This, of course, is their first major tournament for 20 three years. So the group is still open. Bear in mind that just three years ago, England made the World Cup semi-finals. So they will have been expecting, I think, many of their fans to have beaten a side. Let's not forget that he's ranked 40 places below them in the world rankings, especially given the impressive nature of their performance against Croatia in their opening match here 
last weekend, especially when you consider the fact that Scotland struggled, didn't they, against the Czech Republic, being beaten two goals to nil. But I think the manager, Steve Clark's done a fantastic job and he deserves all the credit for getting his players uh, back. I thought the changes he made all worked, four changes he made coming into this match, the likes of Gilmore and Tiernan and Kearney, uh, they all played exceptionally well and uh, they did their country proud and uh, whatever happens now I think this is a result that Scotland in the future and their fans who of course came here only around 3,000 got into Wembley but thousands more have been here in London for an occasion that they really handled it you, you have to say better than England. Dan Rowan at Wembley thank you well there was a, a night of contrasting emotions for England and Scotland fans let's the, get the latest now from Glasgow our correspondent Lorna Gordon is there Lorna. Yes, what a result for Scotland at the end of that game. This fan zone erupted with joy. 3,000 Scotland fans very, very happy at this result. The police in the last few minutes have swept the area, cleared the fans out. But I think the celebrations here will continue well into the night. And what a party. For the Tartan army, games don't get much bigger than this. Thousands travelled to London, the city's mayor asking them to stay away if they didn't have tickets or a safe place to watch the game. We've done it legally. We've followed the rules. Yeah. We've stayed do? in the pubs. Yeah. England fans, the pubs, the restaurants, everywhere have been absolutely fantastic. Amazing. And so far, it has been mostly good-natured. An early flashpoint, smoke bombs thrown by opposing England fans, quickly calmed by police. For those that didn't travel, no less passion and hope. Do his proud, boys. We're here for you. You been there for us. Come on! Yes! 3,000 supporters there for the team in the football fan zone in Glasgow. All you need is hope, all you need is heart. Who cares about the stats? Who cares about the price of players? We're here. That's what is that, 23, it. 24 years? We're here, that's all that counts. See if we beat the English. Nothing's there. coming home. It's coming yes. right. Yeah. Here we are. O'Donnell in for the box. Scotland's best chance in the first half fell to O'Donnell, but it was well saved by Pickford. Scotland went close again early in the second through Dykes, his shot cleared off the line. The tension almost unbearable for the fans as this historic game drew to its close. This oldest of footballing rivalries didn't disappoint. A nation proud that its team made it this far. We are top of the world. Brilliant. Come on, Scotland. We can do this Tuesday night now. We're going to do it. Three points again, Croatia. And we're in the last 16. Come on, Scotland! First one. Lorna Gordon, BBC News, Glasgow. England fans expected tonight. Second best was not an option. Legends of Euros past grew up here. Not for me, 3-4-0. 3-4-0 easy. England are that good and Scotland are that bad. Scotland are that bad, England are that good, yeah, easy. I think it'll be a very slow game, to be honest, but uh, yeah, we'll come out on top. 2-1 England. Definitely 2-1 England. 3-0. 2-0. 3-0. After months of COVID restrictions, these fan zones have been given the green light. It's the sort of atmosphere people have missed and are loving being part of again. It's amazing to be in this atmosphere and be out of the house, be with my friends. And it's social distance, it's great, and we're safe. And it's just, oh, the atmosphere is amazing. Even those getting married today had the match built into their plans, for better or worse. Well, we're going to have a meal and all that, and then we're going for the air. We're going to see where the night goes with a few drinks and all that, and see hopefully England will win. So, you, so the football match is definitely on the agenda? Oh, yes, yes. definitely, definitely. <laughs> Do you mind? Well, I haven't got a lot of choice. <laughs> <laughs> At kickoff, there were high hopes, but a goalless first half wasn't quite to plan. Although they were still optimistic at half time. It's been a pretty even contest in the first half, but I think as the game wears on, our quality will show. So I'm still confident that England will win the game. I feel like we've played okay. There is room for improvement. If uh, John Stones put that header away, then it'd be a different game. 
But it wasn't to be. The belief of the fans didn't transfer to the team on the pitch. Still, everyone had the sort of big night out they hadn't had for a long time. I think it's uh, fair to say that uh, England fans, broadly speaking, are underwhelmed with what, happening this, with what happened this evening. They certainly expected a lot more. They, of course, as you heard there, expected some goals. However, what you have had this evening is quite a big outdoor event that we haven't seen for many months here in the UK. And I think, broadly speaking, people really did have a good evening. They did enjoy it. They're still in good spirits, even after a, a nil-nil draw. So they've had a good time at the, at the very least, although they just hoped that England would actually get a win on the pitch. It wasn't to be. We have to move on to the next game, Sophie. Danny Savage, thank you. Denmark's Christian Eriksen has been discharged from hospital after a successful operation to fit a heart-starting device. The Danish midfielder suffered a cardiac arrest during his side's defeat by Finland in Copenhagen on Saturday. He visited the team today and will now return home with his family. The Liberal Democrat leader, Sir Ed Davey, has said the party's historic win in the Chesham and Amersham by-election will send a shockwave through British politics. The Conservatives had held the seat since its creation in 1974, but the Lib Dem candidate managed to overturn a 16,000 majority and win by more than 8,000 votes. Our Deputy Political Editor Vicky Young reports. Finally, the Liberal Democrats have something to cheer about. Victory in a leafy Buckinghamshire seat the Conservatives would never have dreamt of losing. Enough is enough. We will be heard and this government will listen. How are you feeling, Mr Davey? Very happy. And a rare chance for the Lib Dem leader to make the headlines. Do you know what happens when a really powerful, strong orange force goes against a blue wall? Let me show you. Polls suggest just 7% of voters back his party, but Sir Ed Davey insists this isn't a one-off, and Lib Dems could knock down other Conservative strongholds in southern England. I think there's a shockwave through British politics. This wasn't just another Liberal Democrat by-election victory, it was one of our best ever. Uh, and on the uh, swing that we achieved, dozens of Conservative seats would fall to the Liberal Democrats the next election. So all the Lib Dems we know are good at spectacular by-election wins and they will see this as a sign that they're the main challengers to the Tories in many southern seats, not Labour. And there are Conservative MPs concerned that there's been too much emphasis on the north of England and this is what happens when Tory voters feel ignored. Many here are furious about HS2, the high-speed rail link being carved through the Chilterns, and new planning proposals, which could mean more housing developments. On the high street in Amersham, voters reflected on the Conservatives' defeat. Totally taking it for granted, and they haven't worked for our votes this time round at all. The HS2 building, which was driven by the Conservative government, has made people have a protest vote for Lib Dem, but I'm not entirely sure if it's the start of the blue wall. Yeah. tumbling down. I think that's, I think that's a a maybe a little bit too far. Yeah. I felt, quite honestly, we've been taken for granted in this constituency. Okay. I speak as a Tory voter okay. who has always voted Tory, has never ever voted Liberal Democrat in my life, but did so at this election. Labour received a dismal 622 votes, the worst by-election result in the party's history. And for Boris Johnson, the outcome was a rare electoral defeat. Well, yes, it was, a, was a, certainly a disappointing result, and, uh, but there were particular circumstances there and um, we are getting on with delivering our agenda for the whole country. This victory could be down to many things, a well-organised campaign on local issues and lingering anti-Brexit sentiment in a Remain voting area. But many Conservatives believe in a general election the result would still go their way. Vicky Young, BBC News, Amersham. New data from Public Health England suggests that a single dose of the Pfizer or AstraZeneca vaccine reduces the risk of needing hospital treatment by three quarters. The news comes as the booking system for coronavirus vaccines in England has been open to everyone over the age of 18. Here's our health correspondent, Catherine Burns. In normal times, this would be entirely unremarkable festival-goers braving the British summer weather. I feel a wee bit damp, but it's, this will be the highlight of my year. 
Download Festival at Donington Park in Leicestershire is going ahead as part of a government pilot scheme. Everyone's had to test for coronavirus before pitching their tents. No tents in Sheffield, but the queues for vaccines started early this morning. From today, all over 18s in England can book theirs. My arm doesn't hurt too bad, and I think that's outweighed by the uh, prospect of having normal life back. Normal life was pencilled in to start in England next Monday, but it's been pushed back a month to get as many people vaccinated as possible. 18-year-old Andreas and his mates have just left sixth form and want to celebrate before university. How does it feel that it's finally your go after seeing all the other ages have theirs? It's just a good to feel like you're actually doing something because for so long we've just been sitting doing nothing. Yeah, I just really want to get the vaccine so that I can sort of go out as much as I can this summer. Long term, it's probably good we all get it, but short term, I don't think it makes any real difference to your life, what you can do. But Flo, unlike the rest of these guys, you're not 18 yet, are you? No, I'm not. And there is a level of vaccine envy. <laughs> it's kind of a race at this point between the vaccinations and the increasing cases at the moment. Figures from the Office for National Statistics suggest that one in 540 people across the UK would test positive for COVID. That is up, not hugely, about 10% on the week before. This vaccine push comes as Public Health England says 99% of the cases it's checking are now the Delta variant. And since February, 806 people with it have needed hospital treatment but only 84 of them were double vaccinated. And there's good news too about the impact of a single jab. If you've had two doses of uh, either of these vaccines, you're more or less guaranteed not to end up in hospital. Your chances of ending up in hospital are, are reduced by more than 20 times. Um, and even one dose, once you've had a chance to make an, an immune response to it, will very substantially reduce the risk of ending up in hospital. Just lift your sleep for me, please. With just 31 days now until the 19th of July, the postponed Freedom Day, every jab in every arm will give us extra protection. Catherine Burns, BBC News. Well, the latest government figures show that in the past 24 hours, 11 deaths were reported and 10,476 new infections were recorded. It means an average of 8,740 new cases per day in the last week. Nearly 244,000 people received a first dose of the vaccine in the latest 24-hour period. Almost 42.5 million people have now had their first jab. That's just over 80% of UK adults. More than 223,000 people have had their second dose of the vaccine in the latest 24-hour period, so almost 30.9 million people have had both doses. That's 58.7% of adults. Italy has announced that from Monday, any visitors arriving from Britain will have to be tested and quarantined for five days. Our correspondent Mark Lowen is in Rome for us. And uh, Mark, Italy is a big summer holiday destination. Does it make any difference if you've had the double jab or not? No, Sophie, it won't. All travellers coming from the UK, whether or not they're fully vaccinated, will have to quarantine for five days and be tested amid growing fears of the spread of the Delta variant in the UK and even the fact that even with two doses of the vaccine, you could potentially carry it. Italy's COVID infection rate is currently about a fifth of that of the UK, and it's taking no chances. Now, Welsh football fans coming here to Rome for Sunday's it uh, Italy-Wales Euro 2020 match don't need to worry because the quarantine rule is coming in on Monday. We don't yet know how long it will last, but past quarantine decisions have tended to last a good few weeks. And of course, Italy is still on the UK's amber list. So even if British tourists do come here, they would have to quarantine for 10 days on their return to the UK. Last month, the big southern European tourism destinations, Italy, Greece, Portugal and Spain, all opened their doors to British travellers. Italy is now, in effect, the first to partially close the doors once again, further dashing the hopes of British holiday Daymakers hoping to have some Italian sunshine this summer. Mark Lone in Rome, thank you. People in Iran have been voting for a new president. The country is facing big challenges from the pandemic and an economic crisis to soaring inflation and continuing US sanctions. The winner is expected to be a hardline candidate who has close links to the country's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. 
Ibrahim Raisi is head of the judiciary and a religious conservative who's led crackdowns on popular protest and demands for reform. Many more moderate candidates have been barred from standing. The election comes at a delicate time with hopes that Iran will return to the deal that restricted its nuclear program. Our Middle East editor, Jeremy Bowen, reports. <laughs> Elections in Iran are not free or fair, but they're a window into an opaque country with a repressive regime. Any resemblance to democracy is coincidental. Candidates are vetted in advance. Millions of frustrated Iranians have stopped hoping that voting will improve their lives. In the city of Shiraz, he was pulling down every election poster he could find. Well done shouts the man in the car. This man posted a plea to boycott the election, next to portraits of his son, Amir Hussein, who was killed with hundreds of others in protests in 2019. My vote, he says, is for the downfall of the dictator and the criminals who've sold out the country. A hardliner, Ibrahim Raisi, the head of the judiciary, seems to have a clear path to the presidency. His strongest rivals were not allowed to stand. Get set. A viral video compared Raisi to the murderous Middle Eastern tyrant in the Sasha Baron Cohen film The Dictator, partly because of the way that voters were denied a real choice. And it's because of the executions of thousands of regime opponents in the late 1980s. Raisi was one of their prosecutors. His past sends a bleak message to Iranian reformists who want more freedom. This man, not the president, is at the pinnacle of power in Iran. He's Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the 82-year-old supreme leader who seems determined to deliver a victory for conservative hardliners. The only candidate left who might appeal to reformists is Abul Nasser Hemati, the former central bank governor. Elections in Iran can produce surprises, but he needs a miracle. Iran's nuclear future remains the big issue for any president. Ibrahim Raisi says he supports reviving the international deal that restricts Iran's capabilities. Iran's price would be an end to the sanctions that have caused real hardship. This was a cue for chicken in a country with huge reserves of oil. Whoever's president, Iranian people need some relief. Jeremy Bowen, BBC News. The Conservative MP for Wakefield, Imran Ahmed Khan, has been charged with sexually assaulting a 15-year-old boy in 2008. Mr Khan, who was elected in 2019, has released a statement denying the allegation in the strongest terms. He will appear at the Central Criminal Court on the 15th of July. The Conservatives say he has been suspended from the party. An NHS trust has been fined more than £730,000 for failing to provide safe care and treatment following the death of a baby boy. East Kent hospitals admitted failures in the case of Harry Richford, who died seven days after his emergency delivery in November 2017. Our social affairs correspondent Michael Buchanan reports. They didn't want to be here. They shouldn't have been here. But today, Sarah and Tom Richford came to court to hear the NHS trust that failed them receive a record fine. Their son Harry died in 2017 after a catastrophic series of errors in maternity care. At Folkestone Magistrates Court, the East Kent Hospitals Trust was fined a record £733,000 for failing to provide safe care and treatment to both Harry and Sarah. Sadly, both individual and systemic errors were pushed aside for many years with no learning taking place. This failure to learn has led to the significant failings witnessed in Harry's death and no doubt countless others which are now being investigated. Before Harry Richford's death, maternity problems were mounting. In 2014, the Trust investigated eight neonatal deaths in just eight months. In 2015, an external review for maternity consultants didn't carry out war rounds or review women. In 2017, management acknowledged problems in developing a safe patient culture in maternity care. 
Following the fine, the Trust apologised and said improvements were underway. Learning lessons and efforts to improve should never stop and we will work tirelessly to provide high quality maternity services which continually strive for improvement and are safe, effective and centred on the women and children we care for. An independent investigation into maternity care across East Kent is now examining around 200 cases. For Harry's parents, who had to fight for answers and accountability, today marked an ending of sorts. We would now ask to be given privacy to take today's news on board. We will privately support any future investigations in an effort to ensure long-lasting change at local and national levels as the legacy for Harry's short life. Hopefully, less families will have to suffer unnecessary birth, death or injury bereavement as a result. Michael Buchanan, BBC News, Kent. Coronavirus has been spreading remorselessly to some of the world's most remote places. Nepal in the Himalayas is experiencing a devastating second wave of infections with thousands of deaths. Gurkha veterans and their families are among those suffering in isolated rural villages far from hospitals or health care. Our correspondent Rajini Vaidnathan has been to the remote region of Gorkha. The virus has now travelled to every corner of this mountain nation. We journeyed through the rugged foothills of the Himalayas to the Gorkha region, where there's been a steep rise in cases. Here, navigating the terrain is as tough as getting access to medical help. The views are spectacular, but the road conditions are difficult. We are in a remote part of Nepal now, in the Gorkha district. There aren't hospitals here for hours. Just imagine trying to get emergency health care in this kind of situation. We reach Barpak, known as the village of the brave, home to many Gurkha veterans and their families. This was the epicentre of Nepal's devastating earthquake in 2015. A community rebuilt, now struggling to contain the virus. Locals say dozens have died of COVID in this recent wave. One of the victims, Ram Bahadur Gale, who served in the Queen's Gurkha engineers, left behind his son Hari, already penniless, now fabulous. He says he couldn't afford to take his dad to the nearest hospital, a three-hour drive or a two-day walk. We don't have proper medical facilities in Bar Park. We only have a small health clinic, so even if we get a fracture and need an X-ray, we have to travel far. We couldn't get a car to take him to the hospital. The only option would have been by helicopter. We couldn't afford that. The Delta variant spread as migrant workers returned to their villages from India. Vaccines aren't reaching as fast. Only 8% of people have had a first dose. Supplies from India were suspended. Some are coming from China. But it's still left more than a million elderly Nepalis waiting for their second shot of the AstraZeneca. Gurkha veteran Lashaman Gale is holding on to his vaccination card and to the hope other nations will help. We served in the British Army. It would be nice if they could give us vaccines. There are many people who need them in Nepal, not just us. In a country famed for the most challenging of treks, <laughs> yeah. these journeys are the toughest. A village says goodbye to another Covid victim who couldn't get oxygen in time. Even before the virus came along, they lived a life of isolation. Now, for so many in rural Nepal, it's turned into one of desperation. Regini Vaidyanathan, BBC News, Gorkha, Nepal. And finally, a British woman who was attacked by a crocodile while swimming in a lagoon in Mexico has been released from hospital. Our correspondent, Will Grant, has been talking to her twin sister who managed to fight off the crocodile and save her. A bandage hiding the teeth marks in her wrist. 
the only outward sign of Georgia Laurie's fight with a crocodile. I actually heard her scream and I saw her being taken underneath and by the crocodile. Um, and then I realised she was really in trouble when I was calling out her name and there was no response from her. It grabbed her on the leg um, and, and her behind and tried to death roll her and drag her away. So I, I was beating it on, on its snout and it grabbed my wrist and my arm. So I had to um, beat it off with, with, the other, with my other arm. Their nightmare began here at the Manialtepec Lagoon. An unlicensed German guide told their tour group it was safe to swim in these waters, despite it being hatching season for crocodiles. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, mis mistakes happen and, and I don't want him to feel any worse because we all make mistakes. I guess it's a pretty big one. Georgia's bravery undoubtedly saved Melissa, who still has months of recovery ahead. I helped save my sister's life. Um, but also, um, I want to touch on, she fought for her own life as well. She really, she really fought and clung on. Will Grant, BBC News, Puerto Escondido. And that's it from us. Good night.